Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Our second session is titled Restitution and Repatriation of Looted Artworks and Artifacts. It's a pleasure to welcome our panelists, architect Sir David Ajay, uh, Nairi Black Blankenberg, director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Arts, and Chika Okeke Agulu, director of the program in African Studies and professor of art and archaeology and African American Studies at Princeton University. Our moderator for this session is Salah Hassan, director of the Africa Institute, Sharjah, and distinguished professor of arts and sciences at Cornell University. Each panelist will present first, followed by a discussion and audience Q&A. I'd now like to hand over to you, Salah. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. Obviously, I'm not a panelist, and I'm not going to take uh, all the uh, podium here and have my own presentation. I just, it's just welcoming remarks. So welcome, everyone. And also, I'm so grateful to SAF and all the staff of SAF for managing you know, and, 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 and producing this wonderful event. Uh, I'm also uh, you know, grateful uh, to the speakers here. And I just want to mention one fact is that in the program, there's supposed to be Michael Rykovich, the Iraqi artist who lives in Chicago, joining us. But unfortunately, he can't. Uh, so what I will try to say is that we couldn't have assembled a greater panel than uh, colleagues here on the stage. The first is uh, Nyari uh, Blackenberg, who is the uh, director of the uh, Smithsonian uh, National Museum of African Art. So she brings that perspective to the talk. And then a world-renowned architect, David Ajay, who was engaged productively in building that kind of infrastructure that counter currents to some of the argument that we see from Western Museum in resisting restitution or reparation of the art, uh, repatriation of art object. And also a world-renowned scholar, my colleague and comrade in arms, and for a long time, long time friend, Chico Okeke, who is a professor at Princeton and who has been a champion at the theoretical level uh, in kind of, you know, kind of providing the argument, providing the theoretical background to the issue of restitution and arguing against all kind of odd argument that are anti-reparation or repatriation. So four years ago, actually, there was a, a report that was released by the French government uh, and issued or written by two scholars, Felwin Sar and Benedict Savoy. The, uh, it is entitled, for some of you who are curious, uh, Restitution of African Cultural Heritage Towards a New uh, Relational Ethics. It was a report that was commissioned by President Macron, the President of the French Republic. And of course, with uh, the very fact that it's commissioned by, uh, by, by uh, Macron, it is limited in its charge, being uh, pre issued by a president of a former colonizer like France, so it's doomed from the beginning to be to, with this kind of limitation. Also, the charge itself limited it to Francophonie Africa and thereby adhering to the old colonial tropes within African studies that are riddled by artificial binaries and, and boundaries. Uh, so the, the debate seems to be conformed or only uh, uh, kind of limited to a certain geography and a certain uh, colonial relationship. But what, what's more about this, uh, uh, what's more important about this uh, report is that it's issued by two savvy academics, Benedict Savoy and Felwin Saar. It is, of course, has many positive elements to it in terms of, uh, you know, theoretical debate, but of course limited by the limitation of the charge itself. Uh, but what it raised, what, what interests me in relation to this panel is the reaction from Western museums to it. One reaction is always the, that is riddled or at least based in the horror evacuee, the fear of empty uh, 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 spaces that is seen to be the argument is that if we give this, the museums in the West, many, many of them, many of these ethnographic museums are filled with objects from Africa and other places. Of course, the debate is not limited to Africa, but we happen to have people who are really working in Africa, and Michael Rakovic could have brought his engagement with that, uh, uh, with, with that work from an artist's perspective, especially like his latest prints or the false prints at the Trafalgar Square that dealt with looted objects as a result of the ISIS, but also as a result of looting 
several museums. And of course, any loot of any non-Western uh, Global South Museum is always going to end up in Western uh, collections. So that is one reaction, the fear of that. But then there is us, the other one is the idea of circulation. That, okay, we can compromise, but the object has to circulate between here and Africa. Then the, ant the argument against the institution always been the idea of uh, provenance. How do we know that the provenance is a certain country so we can return it? And the last argument is always that Africa is not ready to receive this object because it doesn't have the infrastructure. So I'm not going to give another lecture. I just said these are the general questions that I feel this report has brought it back. But one point that is important as a rejoinder or as a disclaimer is that the Savoy report is not the only one. It is actually the last in series of the struggle among diaspora Africans and African themselves in terms of repatriation and restitution of African objects. So I will stop here and I will invite my dear friend Chika to start the uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, Salah, for uh, introducing us to this panel. And uh, I wish to thank uh, dear friend Hor uh, Al Kasimi for uh, leading these institutions here in Sharjah that have provided the space and platform for the kind of conversations that uh, have become the, the calling card of Sharjah and the reason why some of us uh, thoroughly identify with her work and count her uh, as uh, a very strong ally in these projects, in these conversations, these debates, discourses, and practices. Uh, our topic of discussion today, uh, as Salah has uh, wonderfully framed, it has to do, of course, with the response of Western museums to restitution calls, repatriation calls that have been made for such a long time. But these institutions have found very creative ways of avoiding these calls. Uh, they have enacted laws when and if they are uh, owned by states, or they have established um, non-written forms of behaviors if they are privately owned institutions that are answerable to uh, well, very wealthy people, the boards of trustees. Uh, and I'm very much interested in some of these questions, some of these avoidance tactics that have been uh, for the longest time, but more increasingly so, uh, demonstrated by these institutions. And uh, one of them, uh, I'm not sure if we see the screens clearly, is something called retain and explain. So I'm interested in what I call the politics of retain and explain. Hopefully I'll clarify what I'm referring to. Uh, first of all, let's see some art. Uh, Let's see, fabulous art, actually, like masterpieces of art. There's an exhibition ongoing right now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art called The African Origin of Civilization, Myth, or Reality. It's a truly exceptional exhibition, marvelous actually, uh, powerfully installed 
with incredibly works of art made by artists uh, from the African continent. This exhibition, in fact, the, it's one of its main achievements uh, is that it is pairing works from Pharaonic Egypt and works from African art. Uh, this is not the place to go into what that means, uh, the geopolitics of Egypt as a categorical art historical uh, place as different from Africa and African art. I'm not interested in that today. That will be for another day. Uh, but the exhibition, which uh, contains, I think, 21 or 22 objects from the collection, um, the museum, the African gallery is in transition right now. It's been uh, rebuilt, and, and so this is a, uh, an exhibition that is a holding place, right, for when the museum is uh, rebuilt and reinstalled. Out of the 21 or 22 objects, five of them are from Benin. Uh, that is to say, five are Royal Benin artworks that were part of the loot by British soldiers, mostly, uh, in 1897. Um, and so the, the exhibition pairs Pharaonic Egyptian work, and in this case, and I've selected the five Benin objects that are part of the exhibition. Um, these are some of the works, animals, uh, human figures, fragments and full heads, relief objects, uh, relief works. The question, of course, is how is it that, given the cultural diversity of the African continent, even the range of work that a museum like the Met has of African art, uh, that Benin would have five out of the 21. Uh, you can, you know, make a strong argument that Benin sculptors are the, or were the most fabulous sculptors ever, right, from the continent, and therefore uh, have a lion's share right, of uh, African art representation, or maybe, and this is where the Nigerian in me comes out, uh, because Nigerians want to make sure the rest of the continent understands that uh, we are the most powerful country and therefore deserve a lion's share representation um, of uh, anything to do with Africa. So that's, that's my Nigerian. I'm not saying that this has anything to do with the curatorial uh, reasons uh, for, for these choices. Well, as I said, the exhibition is truly remarkable. Uh, masterpieces, of course, the Met is known for uh, keeping, owning, conserving masterpieces. And so this exhibition uh, reifies that. And uh, the eminent critic, Holland Cotter, of the New York Times uh, was quick to write a very important review of this uh, exhibition. And uh, he installed the show, right, impeccably installed. 
But one of the things he said in that review is, now the museum should tell us how the works got there. Actually, they have been doing that, or at least trying to tell us how the works got there uh, fairly recently. So, um, in 2018, I was working on a paper for a conference in Berlin organized by the Humboldt Forum uh, on restitution and repatriation. And I had worked on this paper looking at museums in the United States and the politics of provenance. So today I'm talking about the politics of retain and explain. Uh, and so what you see uh, on the screen is the 2018 object uh, label, the provenance section of it. And uh, I highlight the part that I'm interested in, the primary provenance for the Queen uh, um, Idia mask that you see on the screen uh, says Ralph, Sir Ralph Moore, Benin City, Nigeria and his family around 1897 to 1909. That is the primary provenance in 2018. Um, so either he made the work himself or um, I don't know what the other option <laughs> must be for being the primary provenance. In 2021, which was last year, the object uh, provenance has changed a little bit to say Court of Benin, taken from the Royal Palace in 1897 during the British military occupation of Benin. And then Sir Ralph Moore follows. So you know that he must be connected with this uh, in, you know, invasion, uh, occupation that is referenced. So, in other words, they have been trying to tell us how the works got there. Um, in the same 2018, when the object of the Med began with Sir Ralph Moore, at the Museum of Fine Art in Boston, they have a much more extended label that begins with 16th century commissioned by Oba Esigye or his son, that, 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 right? Um, and all the way to the occupation, the exile, and all of that. So the museum in Boston was telling us a fuller story uh, in its provenance uh, label about how the object in their collection got there. So if we think about then what this exhibition in uh, 2021, 2022, the ongoing exhibition at the Met, where, what does this have to do with what I'm trying to say? Uh, it seems to me that this task of trying to tell us how the works got there is part of a larger project of what I'm calling retain and explain. Um, in other words, uh, what Holland Carter might have uh, missed, at least in the review, is that if you checked the specific objects in this exhibition, uh, the information that the museum has on the object, it's actually a whole long essay that includes the story of the looting of these objects and the fact that the Ober of Benin has called for them to be returned. What it does not say is what they are gonna do about that. Um, it also tells you, as does uh, the British Museum uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, that they are doing a lot to help 
uh, build a museum in Benin. So David um, might have uh, something to show us about that. Uh, that they have been participating in the Benin Dialogue Group um, in digital projects in the, in fact, the possibility um, of loaning the works to this museum uh, that is being built in Benin, loaning the works. It says nothing about the call for repatriation or restitution. Uh, same thing with the Met. There is no indication that uh, they are interested in the question or the request by the Oba of Benin, not to mention the Nigerian government in 1960, African government in 1975, at the UN and so many other instances of calls for the restitution of these objects. Um, now, what does this have to do with retain and explain? Actually, the British Museum has relied a lot on the so-called 1963 Benin, uh, uh, British Museum Act. This act prevents the museum from deaccessioning any work that was made like before 1853. I'm not sure how they arrived at that date, but that's not what's important. It's that there is this act that prevents them legally from letting, well, the Benin bronzes go and others, like the Elgin uh, marbles, well, uh, the Parthenon marbles, or uh, the Ethiopian tablets, and all of that. So there's law that makes it impossible. Never mind that this was 1963. Uh, 1960, 18 or so African countries won their independence. Uh, decolonization was in the air. And uh, it's not unlikely that that act was enacted to preempt these decolonizing nations from knocking on their doors. And so 1963 was a very important moment to enact a law preventing the British Museum from letting go of all the loot of empire. Um, of course, uh, someone might say, well, that sounds like conspiracy theory. Maybe it is. But it's not insignificant that last year, 2021, a new law was passed also in England, uh, actually strengthening the 1963 law, not weakening it, in spite of all the global international calls for restitution. Um, I might have some uh, quote here from one of the, uh, the community secretary of the UK, one of the champions of this new 2021 uh, law, and it says, our policy in law will be clear that we believe in explaining and retaining heritage, not tearing it down. So explain and retain, at least the British, um, well, quite, uh, the politicians there, quite forthright in terms of what retain and explain is about. It's retain and explain so we don't tear down our cultural heritage. So retain and explain is a way of responding to calls for restitution without actually engaging in restitution and repatriation. Retain and explain uh, sounds more like detain and exploit to me. 
Um, the problem, of course, is that when you detain and explain, so I'm turning around the, this phrasing, when you detain and explain what it sounds like to the people, to the societies, to the communities that have been asking uh, for these works or artifacts or objects, material, cultural heritage to be returned or restituted, what they are hearing is, here's why we cannot send these things back. It goes back to the old argument about the Global Museum. The Global Museum that in 2002, supposedly self-respecting directors of the world's supposedly powerful museums came together to sign this document arguing for why the global museums ought to be keeping, conserving the world's heritage for all humanity. 2002, that's what, that was when. So this is politics by other means. This is another tactic of deflecting calls for restitution. That you can now say, well, we need to keep these objects so we can use them to tell the stories of the past, even when they are awful stories. Well, I'm not sure what that sounds like to victims of violence. Uh, we need to retain the artifacts uh, or the traces of the violence that's been perpetrated on you. So we can use them to tell the stories of the violences that were visited on you. That is what retain and explain sounds like to some ears like mine. That retain and explain might seem great as we see, oh, at least they are telling more stories. They are telling us how the objects got there. That's better than not doing that before. But this is the answer until I see otherwise. This is their answer to calls for restitution. Tell more stories about the violent acts that led to how these objects got into these museum collections. And so we have to take it for what it is, that this is one of the new arenas of politics that we must engage in, um, in this long debate, conversation, activism around repairing the damages of colonial violence and post-imperial nationalisms. Thank you. Nyeri, welcome to the stage. Um, thanks, everyone, and thanks, Chika. Thanks to the Sharjah Art Foundation and Salah. Um, it's, it's great to be here, and uh, I agree with everything that Chika just said. <laughs> so when I was uh, preparing for this, I, I was like very trying to be all <laughs> smart like you guys and be all philosophical and poetic. So came out with this title, Debris Scatters, the Center Shatters When the Personal and the Institutional Collide. So I thought that was really clever. Um, but then I realized what we're really talking about is uh, repatriation, a comedy. And, okay, wait, I have to move around. So this mic thing is, can I get another of the mic? So, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Because really, um, and we're only in Act One, so I'm going to give you a little uh, behind the scenes look at perhaps some of the, the mechanisms that Chica was talking about. Um, so I was appointed as the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art in DC um, about nine months ago. I can't believe nine months have gone by. Um, it was the 6th of July. Um, and, but I only was able to get into the US in October because of COVID and I was living in, in Spain. Um, 
So I just want to, other than me, <laughs> which is the final cast member, I want to introduce you a little bit to the cast of characters in this comedy. So we've got to start off with this guy. Um, 1846, uh, James Smithson. So he was a British scientist who published at least 27 papers on chemistry, geology, and mineralogy in scientific journals. His topics included the chemi chemical content of a lady's teardrop, the crystalline forms of ice, and an improved method of making coffee. Um, but he was pretty successful. He inherited some money, and then he made some money. Um, he was, it was noted, the illegitimate child of a wealthy Englishman. So I also like that. I have two illegitimate children myself. Um, so feel very close to James. Um, he died and he left his estate to his only living relative with the unusual caveat that should his nephew die without having any more children, then all his money would go to the United States, which was a country he actually had never been to before, to establish an institution for the diffusion and increase of knowledge. Um, so it was odd, and at the time it was in the newspapers, et cetera. It was like, what, what is this guy, guy thinking? He'd, he'd never been here before. Um, and so on our Smithsonian website, it says, some speculate it was because he was denied his father's legacy. Others argue that he was inspired by the United States experiment with democracy. Some attribute his philanthropy to ideals inspired by such organizations as the Royal Institution, which was dedicated to using scientific knowledge to improve human conditions. In short, no one really had any idea, but he did it, and it was a lot of money. It amounted at the time to about a sixth of the entire federal budget of the fledgling United States of America. All right, so that's, he started it. Then we have this guy, Warren Robbins. So Warren Robbins, um, when he started the Museum of African Art, which opened n not as a Smithsonian in 1964, he also had never been to Africa, never worked in a museum, and had never been involved in the arts. In fact, he was a diplomat, and he was um, a cultural attaché for the State Department, and he was in Bonn in Germany. He was walking through the streets, and he went into a shop, window shopping, and he was like, cool. Um, and he spent $15 on a carved wooden figure of a man and a woman um, of the Yoruba people. Um, and then, I guess he got the Africa bug. <laughs> so he, he then uh, he spent a further um, $1,000 on 32 African masks, textiles, and other pieces in a different shop. And then he bought a house, and he put them all up, and he planted a lot of trees to look like the jungle also. Um, which, and he had never been there. Um, anyway, then, you know, some people wanted to see it, and so he thought, okay, look, this is great. I'm going to start a real museum. So he bought the house that used to belong to Frederick Douglass, the, uh, the American abolitionist, and um, he opened a center for cross-cultural understanding. And I'm not going to slag Warren. He didn't, he, he, he actually, I'll tell you about his first trip to Africa, but his whole thing at the, that time was very much a product of the civil rights movement in the US, right? It was like the only African art, African anything museum at the time. And the idea was to show African American kids and people that there was a greater story, a greater heritage, a greater history. So, I mean, until David stepped in, that was the only African um, art or African any museum as part of the Smithsonian. It's quite interesting, the first time Robbins went to Africa was actually in 1973, 10 years after um, the museum was open, and his mission then was one of repatriation. So he was gonna return a century-old statue of a beaded figure called Afoa Kom, um, regarded as sacred by the people of the Kingdom of Kom. And it was stolen, um, and then the Times traced that it had stolen, and so he raised money to buy it, and then he took it back. Um, Robbins was unapologetic in the face of complaints that he was a white man operating a museum of African art, noting that I make no apologies for being white, you don't have to be Chinese to appreciate ancient ceramics, and you don't have to be a fish to be an ichthyologist. All right. Um, okay, so then I'm going to skip a bunch of people, because <laughs> there are way more and I only have 20 minutes. Um, so enter Lonnie Bunch in 2019, just before the pandemic. Um, so now it's a completely different ball game. After 175 years of being led by white men, in 2019, the Smithsonian appointed an African-American man 
um, to lead the entire institution. It was the first time a historian had done so, the first time an African-American man had done so. And Lonnie Bunch had been a 30, what was he? 30 plus year veteran of the Smithsonian. He was a career, in a way, Smithsonian. He was a historian, and he was the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which the museum I lead is not. <laughs> uh, so the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which took a while, was really led by the vision of Lonnie Bunch, and it's a spectacular museum that our friend um, here designed. Um, and it really told the story of African-American um, history and culture, including some African art. In 2019, um, so Lonnie, though, has done a lot more than start the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. Since he has been the secretary, he appointed this guy, who's another character. So this is Kevin Gover. This is my boss. Um, he's the Undersecretary of Museums and Culture at the museum. He's a citizen of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma and a former director of the National Museum of the American Indian, which was established in 1989 with imperatives re of repatriation in its founding statute. And I think that that is really significant. And then they all appointed this person. So this is me. Um, and I was appointed, as I said, in 2021. And I am not like any of you guys. <laughs> so I'm not an art historian. I actually was a museum consultant. Um, I started my career as a, well, I was a jazz poet, but I didn't make money from it. So I did jazz poetry, and then I was a youth worker, and then I was a television producer, and then I became a, a museum consultant. And so I've advised museums all over the world, all different types of museums, science and space and children and history. I've worked on four or five national museums. Um, I've worked on the Museum of uh, Ethnographie Genève that Brooke Andrews was talking about yesterday. Um, so museums here, DCA, museums everywhere. So my whole thing has been like museums, 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 just to give you an idea. I'm also South African, Canadian, New Zealander. My father is a colored person with albinism. Um, I have, mal and just to say, I'm very difficult to classify or put into any boxes. I have two illegitimate children with two different fathers, both South African. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, yeah, so anyway, you get the picture. So I'm not like, like any of this. And so when I was sort of researching for this talk, I was like, oh, well, what, like, what are the steps in a comedy? Like, how, how do you do a comedy? So apparently there has to be like a conflict between the prot protagonist and the antagonist. So you may think that, okay, these are our board members who are great. And these two are just a stand-in for all of the board members. But what I want to talk about also is here, these guys on the, on the right here, which are also a stand-in. Um, for the staff that I inherited, who are not the antagonist in this story, although maybe kind of. Um, so when I joined um, NAMAFA, it's a predominantly white American permanent staff, 20 out of 29 people. They're all Smithsonian long timers. The average numbers of years of service is 16 years. All right, so there's a deep investment in a particular kind of professional practice and a particular way of doing things. Um, there were five who had been with the museum for over 30 years who actually came with Warren Robbins when the Smithsonian, I mean, when the NAMAFA became part of the Smithsonian. Um, there's one African person on staff. Um, there's African American staff people, mainly in administration. Um, other African or African diasporic people are contractors in programming, all except two are English speaking. Um, so there's a lot of good intention. There is only good intention, like most museums. There's a huge amount of professional identification, and that's so key. Like my job, my identity as a conservator, as a registrar, as a is it the the like I'm really invested in a particular way of doing things. Um, there's a fair amount of white privilege, a dose of white fragility, and definitely signs of trauma. All right, so, <laughs> and I walk in, right? yay. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of context, as I said, um, NAMAFA was founded in 64 by Warren Robbins um, the, to promote cross-cultural understanding. That's him with um, Alex Haley of Roots fame. 
Um, we have a collection of about 12,697 works. Of those, 11,400 are classical works, historical work. Contemporary is less than 10% of our collection. I would say, don't call me on it because we don't know, is maybe about 9% of the collection is, hmm, <laughs> is a little, hmm, we're not sure what the provenance is, you know, I don't know. Um, this is also something that's really important to understand, and maybe this is not actually the context. This, this, my friends, is the antagonist we're talking about. So on the left, you have our organogram in progress, and on the right, you have just a little bit of the Smithsonian organogram. The Smithsonian is composed of 21 museums, the National Zoo, nine research facilities. It's a federal, independent federal trust instrumentality governed by a board of regions of which the Vice President of the United States is part of. Um, it has 155.5 million objects and specimens. 94% of these are science, 5% are history, and 1%, probably less than 1%, is art. All right, but in addition to all of that, you've got the Office of the General Counsel, the lawyers, the Office of Contracting, who are the contractor lawyers. You have the Office of Human Resources. You have so many departments and people that I have never met before. Okay, so I rock in and I'm like, oh, I've got this great vision. So first, I'm gonna repatriate and repair, <laughs> and then I'm gonna decolonize and Africanize. Um, and then, that'll take about six months, I'm gonna build a 21st century Global African Art Museum. So this is actually what I would prefer to be talking to you about because I think it's way funner. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do a distributed museum, mobile, interdisciplinary, regenerative, and relevant. And really, this is what we are going to do together. Um, and we are going to focus on global African audience, staff, collection, artists, spaces, partners. It will be of Africa and for Africa, not about Africa. Um, and we'll produce African art experiences, knowledge production. We're going to have a massive impact. And in the end, we are going to contribute to a regenerative art ecosystem. And this is still the plan. Okay, so I'm like, yay, that'll take a couple years, and then yay. Okay, so then we start. Repatriate, repair, decolonize, Africanize. So this is where it, it starts. Okay, so we had, we had um, about 18 bronzes. We have a total of um, 39 works of art from the royal court of the Kingdom of Benin in our collection. Of these, 18 were on display. You can see some of them on display here. And we had what Chica explained as retained and explained. So we have a little... Um, thingy on the side that talks about the raid of Benin, uh, on Benin, 1897, and how the objects are looted, and how we're in discussion um, about it. All right, so I'm like, no, 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 just take them down. All right, because, you know, and I've said this before, I don't like seeing stolen stuff in museums um, from any culture. It makes me uncomfortable. It makes me, like, stressed, and then I get all, like, worked up, and then... Um, I just can't actually enjoy the museum. So I, I was like, you know what, take them down until we figure out what we're going to do about it. Um, and then I put a little thingy up that said, explained why. We're taking them down because we think they do harm, and until which time we know we're going to establish what we're going to do with it, we're not, we're not going to show them. And I just did this. I mean, I actually literally did it two weeks after I arrived in D.C. And I was like, grab power, and you're just going to be able to do it. And then I went to Nigeria. Totally, totally unrelated to this. Like completely, we were doing a little pop-up, which I'll show you after. Barnaby Phillips um, called me up and he's like, oh, I was at an event in Scotland and with Professor Tijani. Oh yeah, and before I called the Professor Abba Tijani National Council of Museums and Monuments, and I was like, we've got some of your stuff. I think it belongs to you. What do you want us to do with it? So we started talking and et cetera. And then I went to, to Nigeria, Barnaby called me, he was like, what's going on? I said, well, I took them down. I didn't, I, I'm so, such a newbie, right? I didn't really realized that this was a thing, and, um, and he tweeted, and then we had a big explosion. But at the same time, this is my story, right? We're there, we're doing 24 hours of the Smithsonian in Lagos. We're, we've got this whole exhibition called Taste. We've got like a tableau vivant, and we have an artist, and we're doing like cool art things. <laughs> um, and so then these two stories start to compete. 
So what starts to, I, I get a foreboding of this because I can see in the media reports and I'm sort of running all over the place, but we're really seeing a major, major, major clash of values internally at the Smithsonian. And I think it's so important to understand with these processes, there is power and leadership around a decision to return things. But as I mentioned, there's so many people involved and so many visceral reactions that you, you have to do both therapy and I don't know what else. There's a, there's a mental liberty or process that you have to go through alongside the legal one. You have conflicts between the personal and institutional. You have conflicts between hybridity and homogeneity, translocal and national. We're at the American Museum. It's American National Museum. Immigrant and patriot, right? Because I'm talking about, I, I am actually want to talk about all the immigrants, all the African immigrants who are in DC and all the global Africans that are around the world. Conflicts between professional and lived experience, conservation and activation, protection, transformation. So you can see it just goes on and on and on. All right, and you start to see like some of these things start to come to play. And I know I have to whip through this. So we have all the Americans that are like, whoa, the Smithsonian bronzes, 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 right? So it's New York Times, Hyperallergic, the art newspaper, et cetera. Uh, it's so funny, because I'm actually in Lagos at the time, right? And I'm at a, for a different reason. And I actually, it starts to become this sort of trauma porn, right? Like everybody wants to like focus. And my whole story with the journalists are like, Yes, this is a story, this is what we have to do, but we are building towards a, you know, a, better, <laughs> a better world as possible. Everyone's ignoring me, right? Interestingly, this is one of the stories in this day, a newspaper in Lagos, and they go on and on, they say all the great things that I wanna say, whatever, and then in the end, they have a little quote about me addressing repatriation, but it's like tucked in the end <laughs> there. And they're the only ones who pick up the story, which, this, which is what my story is. We're building a global African art museum for and of Africans. And, and in order to do so legitimately, we just have to get rid of the stuff that doesn't belong to us. So this is the process of repatriation at the Smithsonian. Now, this is a tiny little chart <laughs> that never existed. Because I spent a lot of time saying, okay, well, I said I want to give these stuff back. Now what do I have to do? So everyone said, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. And I'm like, okay, but what, what does have to happen? Like, what is the process? And everyone tells me a different thing. And so I make this chart, and then I check, and I make this chart, right? These are all the people it has to go through. <laughs> The blue are all like my staff internally, the curator, the registrar, an external appraiser we have to hire, the director, the board. This is the source, which is, you know, I'm not talking about even on, on the, the recipient side at this point. This is just internal. And then it's Smithsonian, the National um, Collections Program, and the Office of the General Counsel, under Secretary, Secretary Committee, Board of Regents. And the, reason it, the only reason it has to go through to the Board of Regents, which is the uber body, is because of the value of the work. It's got really, it's not about the repatriation of the work. And immediately, you start to see the clash of these values. Consider all the people that I have to speak to, or write to, or justify to, in order to do what is pretty much a simple task. So we start here, we have protection versus transformation. The entire Smithsonian is about protecting the institution. I keep saying protecting from who exactly? From the like, from the OBA? From, like from who? From like the people asking for their stuff back? From the artists? From who are we protecting it from? But it's a, it's a, it's a mentality. And you can see here, then we have to determine which works. We have to do a provenance report. So just getting a list is a mission and a half. So I get this big list, which is la la la, likely, la la la, possibly, la la la, probably, la la la, maybe, la la la, whatever, right? Which is right, okay? Provenance research is a very inexact science and we can talk about it another time. And then we have to prepare this report and this report and this report and this report and this report. Where are we? Right here. All right, so after going through all of this, protection, transformation, then issues of ownership and stewardship, because we're talking with lawyers, right? They're like, what are, what's in the contract? Professional lived experience, people being conservationists, registrars, their whole job is to protect our collection and never ever give it up. Um, so we're like, okay, you've got to think about this different. Monetary value versus cultural value. We've got the appraisers who have like a major difference in their estimation of the work. All of this is an inexact, highly subjective piece of work, right? And we're only halfway through. 
it is only here, <laughs> which what is he doing? Um, that we have to do a repatriation plan with the source of community, which is essentially what's called a disposal plan, which is what's going to happen with the stuff. And we've got plans for that. And David can talk a little bit. They're not about some possibilities, not necessarily of us. So let me just go through this. And I'm going to finish it up. Because we're only halfway through. I'm sorry. There's no tidy ending. I want to give the stuff back. Everybody wants to have the stuff back. I'm trying my best, but we'll see what will happen. But I just want to remind you that the next time, hopefully, if I ever speak to you again, I want to talk about this vision, which is a completely new museum model. We need to build a new museum model. And I've been incredibly energized and inspired by many of your talks about thinking about how we do that differently. It's also been extremely depressing because all of you are like critics, so you're all telling me like how museums suck. And I don't <laughs> disagree, but I've got to build something or, or not, but I, I do have an issue. But I, I do invite you all to play your part in this ongoing comedy, tragic comedy, hopefully not a tragedy, um, hopefully an excellent action movie. Here's my contact numbers. I'm hiring tons of positions. <laughs> I need partners um, and thought partners, and we'll see how it all goes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Neri. Uh, David? Um, thank you. Amazing to hear Chika set the stage, and Neri, thank you so much for being so brave. I've never heard a, a museum director talk the way you've talked about um, the issues at hand in this century. <laughs> that should be a model. It should have been recorded and sent out to, to, to several people. Um, I guess I'm really um, doing a sort of third act, I guess. And my act really speaks to this question of um, the ability to hold the objects in the places from which they come from. And I was brought in by the Legacy Trust to really comprehensively understand, well, brought in by the Legacy Trust and by the, the governor of Edo State to, to think through what uh, a museum could be um, for the repair, um, repatriation of objects, which was a discussion happening with uh, a group called the Benin Dialogue, which Chica referred to for you know, 15, 15 odd years, no, 20 odd years. Um, and to think about what a museum would mean in the city. The city has a federal museum, but it's in a sort of colonial park. It's part of the kind of residue of a sort of uh, uh, post-war planning about the idea of uh, making cities, which was a kind of modernist diagram. Um, and Benin is an extraordinary place full of this extraordinary heritage a little bit like Athens, I sort of really sort of made this comparison of Benin and Athens in the sense that it's a city which has this extraordinary cultural history, a thousand year history, destroyed in the 19th century and then everything is gone, more or less. So it's, 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 it's one of the most heart-wrenching things to be able to go to a city with so much history and to only have just fragments of this in the place as a way to try and stitch back the kind of incredible um, power of that place. And, and these two images were things that we were looking at in our studio. The idea of what these objects were, ancestral shrine objects that lasted you know, hundreds of years, generations, speaking about histories and cultures and narratives, and the moment of the destruction and the sort of aggregation of that. Of that. You know, what was precise about that was the destruction of the fabric of the, of the objects. So the context of the objects was seen by the British intelligence as being too important to, to leave as is. So there was a systematic um, discussion to destroy the palaces, destroy the, the spaces in which the objects were, and to decontextualize the objects in order that they could be kind of assembled and then uh, re reimagined re, um, re in new forms as colonial tropes of, of, of war. And I think that it's very important to understand this because that's really the basis by which we started to understand what our job was going to be in this project. So these objects which are sacred shrine objects mostly, or palace objects, or objects of governance, objects of history, um, 
uh, which have a direct relationship to architecture um, and the way in which architecture and, and art curate culture, um, uh, the framework of, of, of sort of the way in which the society kind of organizes itself, gets dismantled and then um, the objects can then be taken and then re reimagined in new ways. It then allows for the objects to then be cluttered into boxes like this um, and then become sort of almost like anthropological kind of analysis, this kind of idea of a scientific sort of um, cataloging and um, sort, of, uh, sort of indexing of, of objects according to material or scale or all the kind of usual sort of uh, so-called enlightenment strategies of how to kind of, um, kind of code the world. Um, these are some of the images um, of Benin before it was destroyed. Um, these incredible a courtyard, it was basically a courtyard city, um, an extraordinary uh, ecological uh, idea of how to make a city which is basically extracted from a very particular soil base with a very specific water um, sort, of, um, uh, sort of architecture or geology. Um, which allowed for the city to thrive. It had incredible agriculture. They were it's an ag uh, agricultural uh, community. And they were able to then use this particular soil in a ramming technique or brick, dried brick technique, to then create, literally that unearth, that unearthing creates the architecture of the enclosures. It's a series of um, courtyard walls and then incredible atriums. This is just a red, this is a the first picture is from the 19th century. This is a picture from my studio looking at one of the palaces that's still left, um, which just has now iron, iron on top. But the scale of these courtyards, which organize the way in which the life of each part of the um, sort of households, um, high and low, sort of worked. So really, the, contrary to some of the imagery that people have of, of African cities, the idea of the city was this incredible walled uh, palace series of chambers with courts and plazas and squares that then opened up into, at the sort of personal, these extraordinary intimate moments with the sky and with, with the environment. Um, one of the kind of important surveys done on a palace that I became deeply fascinated with and have been fascinated for many years is one of the, this is a palace which really starts to lay out exactly how the, the, the chambers of, of inhabitation happen. Essentially, there's Everything works around this idea of the courtyard because of the climate and the geography. So you come into entrances which are about public, um, of course, all cultures, all human cultures have this, about male and female spaces, about those who serve, about concubines, um, about um, uh, children, etc. And then spaces that relate off to that. Essentially, that's what you're seeing organized without me sort of, sort of going through it. Um, when we were asked to make the museum, we sort of spoke to a lot of people in the, in the city. And so the, the erasure, what's kind of amazing about the erasure that happens through that colonial project, um, specifically with uh, the, the British sort of destruction of Benin, is that the erasure both destroyed the, the collective memory of the community in understanding what their own city was like. So what is inherited is a kind of post-war, um, what I call sort of block work, uh, modernist city, which is counter to everything to do with the way in which for a thousand years their civilization had lived, and, and sort of posits the air conditioning machine as the way in which you live in this tropical environment, and you know, your various wealth allow you to kind of negotiate this uh, ability to get up to that level of civilization, apparently or not. Whereas here, the code of living in this environment was sort of laid, uh, sort of sort of destroyed and actually when you do sort of discussions with school children, which we have done, et cetera, there is no memory of what Benin was. And Benin literally is Rome or Athens in Africa. Our, our project, I mean, I could go through, there's a massive thesis, but I'll just go straight to the uh, sort of thesis of the project. The project is really to imagine a museum as a, as a memory machine not a museum as a, um, uh, as a, as a sort of, uh, it's not a museum, it, is, it, it plays within the same notion of the museum as an enlightenment space, but it's a museum as a way to reconnect back to um, 
narratives which have been lost. So the whole museum presents object and space in this duality and oscillates between how you perceive objects, um, object buildings and space. You enter through a walled courtyard into a walled garden, which is the, the arrival space. And that is a social space for the community that allows for events and all the things that happen within the sort of uh, general life of the city of Benin, but also as a kind of great, obviously, uh, space for um, uh, community, um, for visitors and, and everybody else. What you're presented with is, um, is a museum, a sort of a palace elevated, as it were, so it's not real. Um, uh, and, and it presents a series of courtyards which are made positive. The forms that you see up above are dimensions scaled up of traditional courtyards, which then become rooms for reenactments of historical fragments of architecture in which then the pieces are then, um, our thinking is to then be placed back into. So the proposal is really a kind of new kind of museum where we're making an architecture for architecture. It's a museum of architecture as the museum of uh, uh, of, of, the, of the continent, of a, of a place of erasure. Um, so that really the scale is really hard for a lot of people to understand, but essentially it is a series of climatic rooms that are um, naturally ventilated. Some assist and support uh, spaces, so we keep our energy low. It's really trying to, to use as much as possible. But we reconstruct everything from the spire of the Oba to the gatehouses, to the courtyards, to the medicine rooms, to the chambers, in the kind of what I call the positive courtyards. And then um, a series of spaces between those main rooms which reenact the kind of key tropes of the architecture of the city, remade as best as we can with the help of archeologists and, and the historians that we're working with, um, uh, is where we then display the other objects. Um, um, the objects that are to go in them. So we, we have objects in the context of the gatehouses, the shrines, etc., and then we have the objects as um, a sort of shalaga, a sort of, a sort of visible storage, sort of in the scientific method, but related to the, the spaces that are talking about the contextualization. So we're at the same time not trying to just be romantic about reconstruction, but also talk about um, the fact, talk about the nature of the extraction and the nature of the, the, the scale of, uh, of, of the work. So the, so the museum will be moments where you're able to finally you know, see things that, okay, um, you know, thousand, you know, a hundred years ago you would not have been able to see too, uh, but also things that you would have seen, the spire of the Oba, seeing the serpent and the cockerel, um, which um, will, be, will be made back on this iron wood, iron wood shingle sort of spire, which uh, it's a very unique timber to West Africa, which allowed these palaces to have incredible longevity on this rammed earth uh, construction. The gatehouses, the thresholds of the of the street, from the sort of the the sort of the, the artisans to to the princes and, and 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 sort of the nobility, and the way in which the scarification of the if I can use that word of the mud denoted the um, the. The, the ranking of families, and then the niches, which you see, which is where the bronzes were placed. So really to understand that the bronzes are not just these plaques that are you know, displayed as in that sort of, uh, uh, sort of enlightenment idea of museums, the European idea of museums, as objects to be compared as beauty, but they are fragments of the kind of articulation of a civilization which used architecture as a kind of way to frame its entire uh, sort of uh, way of living. The courtyards are remade, and we are sort of creating the architecture so that it's bathed in a, a particular light, so that you're able to experience those, those moments, and then also, um, you know, right down to the intimacy of a shrine space. Um, and then to be able to understand the relationship between those objects and the, you know, the, the, well, as, I, as I was saying, the, um, the, uh, the, the quantity of extraction and the scale and variety um, 
that was kind of made. So you're seeing sort of in situ examples, and then you're seeing a kind of, you know, the sort of scientific sort of explanation. So in a way, the museum is a sort of, a sort of, a reconciliation, but also a kind of memory chamber and a, and a social space for, um, for this community, and one which we hope, you know, the hope is that the museum activates a renewed interest in, in the exact history, which is literally from what we, the LIDAR surveys are showing, the history of Benin is literally underneath the, the existing city's feet, literally two meters underneath. The foundations of the old world are still there. So there's also a, a, an agenda to use the museum as a way to activate a series of uh, excavations and possible reconstructions of, of palaces in order to start to really think very systematically about um, the providence of this incredible civilization and its history and its artifacts and its objects. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Chika, Nyeri, and David for a wonderful presentation that really uh, brought the issue of uh, reparation, repatriation, and restitution from different angles. And as I said it earlier, from a scholarly, from a scholarly and also uh, executive position in, as a director of a museum, but also with, from, from a position of an architect that deal with the built environment itself and responsive and respond to uh, the major questions about uh, repatriation of, of those objects. Uh, Chika, you build the theoretical ground against the argument that of, of resistance to repatriation. And I think it, it helps a great deal. Uh, but I wanted to ask you a question, is that uh, in your uh, argument, uh, you, you focus on the retain and explain from the perspective of the museum, but then this is all within the argument about restitution. Why not, and this is a question to all of you, why not use a reparation? Because the argument with restitution, which is a word that is, seems to be, uh, Wally Schoenka was actually so introduced, interjected into the discussion, uh, with of course uh, that, that the, the, the liability of the West that is in creation, in the creation of the whole colonial heritage, but it's also, he's speaking about the context of migration, especially in the film by Machia or Negritude. Why, why not reparation? Because it seems to address an issue in the context of African diaspora, especially in the African American context, but also in the context of Africa itself. Why not reparation? Well, Salah, you're asking us to uh, look at the broader context of you know, the legacies of colonialism, right? Which is a legitimate question. Uh, I think that reparation is the broadest umbrella for uh, the segments that we're talking about in today's panel when it comes to works of art. Reparations exist, or rather is in excess of issues about museums and artworks and cultural heritage and what have you. Uh, reparations um, exist at the political, you know, at the realm of the political, at the realm of the economic, uh, relations uh, and so forth. So I don't think that it's an either or. Uh, um, when we're talking about works of art, such as is the case with, uh, with our uh, field of work or fields of work, the two core relevant, directly relevant contexts are repatriation and restitution, both of which are a segment of the broader questions about reparation. So it's, it's not an either or. It's hard to use reparation, both at the level of conceptualization and at the level of programmatic action to deal with issues of art objects that are in museums. 
because it's a much broader question, right? You're talking about objects or artifacts of uh, cultural heritage that are held by certain institutions, uh, lots of which were looted during the colonial period. Uh, to get those things out of these collections, uh, the, the agentive concept and mode of practice would be at the level of restitution, which is really about ownership. Restitution is about ownership. Uh, repatriation is about return, right? And so I think that if we're talking about museums um, and what they hoard, because I like to think of them as hoarders of global cultural heritage, the so-called global museums, they are global because they are hoarding global cultural heritage. Um, that the line of debate and action, I think, would be at the level of restitution and reparation. And I say this because, as Ngaire pointed out at the Smithsonian, at a certain level of object, you have to go to a higher office if it's more than 500,000. It's like what happens in museums, like if the director wants to accession stuff, if it's up to, depending on how wealthy the museum is, um, if it's up to 100,000, 200,000, or 500,000, you might take the decision on your own. If it's more than that, you go to the board. It's beyond your pay grade. The same issues are involved in restitution. And as we hear from her, it's also about money. It's, a, it's also about the monetary values of these things, right? Of course, the art institutions don't like to think, especially museums, don't like to talk about the fact that they're holding really expensive stuff, right? And I know like, like rich people, right? They, they don't like giving up <laughs> their wealth. Museums also behave in that manner. Um, one of the curious things about the, uh, the, the British and their laws and their museums is that when you actually look at the uh, Act of 1963, there's a way that they framed what can be given away, you know, because it's talk about extraordinary circumstances, right? And it almost, they didn't say that, but it's almost as though if the, let's say, British Museum considers certain objects not of great value um, in all its meanings, they can, you know, the act does not, <laughs> right? Uh, and some of the commentators have basically said, there's no way they're gonna let the Benin, you know, uh, so-called bronzes leave because we know how much they cost in the market whenever they show up in the market. So you can never make an argument that they don't meet that value requirement. Uh, they, this argument was made for the, uh, the Ethiopian tabots, right? Because those are things that were looted and kept away in storage, even the curators are not really allowed to go look at them. In the storage rooms where they are kept, because they are so sacred. And the museum actually believes in their sacrality and therefore does not like to mess with them, right? And so what is, what is their value then, right, to the institution if you're not teaching with them, you're not allowed to see them as visitors, not even as curators, then why are they keeping them? Right, so I think that the, the, back to your question, that the reason I would not uh, go into the business of repatriation is I don't have the resources. In other words, this is not my area of expertise. What I do as an artist, as a critic, art historian, is with art and cultural heritage and Restitution and, and uh, repatriation are the platforms for me uh, to be able to engage in a meaningful uh, programmatic 
debates uh, and negotiations right, with these institutions. Thank you so much. Yes. No, but actually, I just want to say something. I really loved your presentation because, and it's also inspiring to me in thinking about building structures. You came into the museum, there is an inherited structure of decision making at the executive level. I'm working on a new institution, I'm supposed to build the structure. So the lesson one to learn is that you don't build the structure that you end up being trapped with. So anyway, thank you for that, but go ahead. <laughs> But I think my point also links those two things together. So I'm not, I mean, I've, you know, getting the Smithsonian into trouble enough, I'm not gonna talk about <laughs> reparations for the American government, not here. But <laughs> um, I think what the important thing is for us to stop doing harm. And it's to understand that that initial act of violence has been perpetuated, continues to be perpetuated in the way that museums uh, the default of many museums today. And for me, that's about understanding that museums are not just about their collection. They're an institutional structure that is about hegemonic power as much as anything else. And, and many of you have talked about this today who, who have better words than I do. But I, I think that for me, it's really important to look at a museum as collections as relationships with communities, living artists, curators, partners, as real estate. Museums occupy often the most expensive real estate in a town and, and are largely tax-free. As an employer, um, as a neighbor. Museums are and a symbolic entity. And so museums actually are not just about their collection. And all of those things together I think contribute to creating or perpetuating this notion of white supremacy or Eurocentricity in how they operate. Repatriation is, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a acknowledgement of harm that was done in the past, and it ob absolutely has to happen. But that's not the end of the conversation. Just because I send back some bronzes doesn't mean that I've decolonized my museum by any stretch of the imagination. And we're in the process right now of looking at how we classify, how we document, how we conserve. What are the protocols of registration, of the language we use in the website, how we create partnerships, how we do contracts, how we hire, how we pay, what are the benefits, etc. All of these things are things that have to happen in order for us to look at this museum model, which is an inheritance from, you know, the European Enlightenment and is there essentially as a mechanism of soft power, and look at how can we create something new. Um, and so I think your question of reparations is extremely astute, because not only do rep reparations talk about a harm that has happened, I think they also acknowledge that there's a, uh, there's a legacy issue. And I think when you talk to Anahisi Coates or anyone else talking about these reparations, it's about that it's not over. And for us, it's not that <laughs> just because we stole some stuff and then bought them from somebody, we did not steal the stuff, by the way, but just because we, <laughs> we bought some stuff from other people who stole some stuff or whatever, and now we're giving it back, it doesn't let us off the hook. And that is the work that all of us have to be doing is to be thinking of another way of operating in this world. Yeah, thank you. I just want to, I'm not going to add to that side of it, but just to say that I think that the notion of reparations is absolutely implicit when the discussion becomes about infrastructure building and, and also capacity building and institution making. Because on the continent, um, just this project that I'm working on, this idea of making such an institution already has kind of activated a huge shift in the way in which the state is actually now even thinking about its own relationship to art and its relationship to um, the institutions that are returning or so those that are deciding to return and realizing that there is absolutely, um, you know, there are two different contexts in which this art is operating, but there's one idea which is about, you know, civilizations and, and you know, keeping civilizations for future generations and teaching and using it as a tool. And I think that what is now become very clear is that the idea of, uh, of this repatriation of the objects is also now kind of about a, a, a co-joining. There is a co-joining that is happening that is impossible to tether. You can't tether yourself from from the fact that you have had the objects for 100, 200, or 50 years, and that you are now co-joined to now imagine new possibilities of institutions in other places. 
And I think that, for me, that is one of the most exciting things about what I think the evolution of the museum is, not in building more and more expansions for your collections, but in imagining new possibilities of new kinds of institutions globally that work as a network to kind of support this idea of you know, civilizations, crafts, and arts. So there's a kind of repatriation in that is what I think that we should be talking about. Yeah, so the, I need to pull back a bit, right? To think about something that David and I were speaking uh, about some months ago, uh, this notion of the post-colonial museum. Um, as a broader uh, idea that actually uh, gets close to what repatriation, or rather reparation, can mean in the context of museum practice um, and relationships of communities and societies to museums. By which I mean that uh, rep reparation and the global museum, what it looks like is not just in returning objects, which is the first step, but what happens after. Right? What types of museums do we want to see in the future? Not just in Africa, but also um, in Europe, right? in Latin America, in Asia. That the post-colonial museum in that of the future would be based on this broader question of reparation, which means that it's not just that you've returned things, but what kinds of relationships can be built that would truly connect museums around the world so that global museums don't exist in New York and London alone or Paris, but that you can go to Johannesburg and meet a global museum. It's not just about returning the objects from Africa. Well, what about the Renaissance objects? Because these museums want to retain some of the African, Asian, whatever objects to teach the world. I would like to see the museum in Johannesburg with medieval stuff, right, with Renaissance objects and paintings uh, that are circulated, right, uh, across these museums so that you can then begin to repair these damages of history, that certain one-line story histories that these museums were perpetuating because they told all the stories. What would happen for a, at a museum in Johannesburg that has Renaissance material, how would they teach those objects or paintings? I bet it will be different from how you might learn about them um, in, in, in London. So I think that when it comes to what museums can become in the context of a reparation and this notion of the post-colonial museum, it is in the circulation of knowledge, not the hoarding, because that's really the, the primary violence of colonization is the hoarding of technologies, of knowledge, production, and dissemination. And until we begin to untangle, or, and in fact, um, work against this notion of, you know, now they call it conserving knowledge, right? But it's still hoarding. <laughs> Can even ask a question? Um, but also extraction. And, and when I talk about a regenerative art ecosystem, that's also really what I'm trying to figure out what that is, right? Because it's not only hoarding, it's like taking away and then hoarding and giving nothing back. So what does it mean to be more regenerative in our practice as institutions? And can museums even do that? I mean, everyone's like, oh, the basic, you know, definition of museums is the, is the hoarding. I, I don't agree, and I, I think of what, you know, how we started off this conference about like, you know, the post-colonial, the decolonial, whatever, who cares? What we need is an institution for now that looks at the crises of emergencies that we all know about really well, but also is regenerative. Like, how, how can we, as institutions, as global institutions, and it could be West, you know, whatever, whatever the dynamics are, but as institutions, because, I mean, even Johannesburg Art Gallery or the Museum Africa in Johannesburg, I mean, they're really, really struggling, but their models are the same. They're ultimately extractive models of taking collections and having them. Museums Absolutely, but how do we, I mean, the, the point of the Benin bronzes, <laughs> the point of all artwork, I think, 
is to document, it's to inspire, um, but it's also to inspire other generations. You know, part of the violence of extraction is removing them. I mean, when we talk to like a lot of Nigerian artists who come to our museum, why do they come to look at the bronzes so they can create other work related to the bronzes? Which means there's a shit ton of people in Edo State who don't have that privilege, right? So in a way, it's like we've got to restore that. We've got to restore that rupture and go back to the reason why we create art in the first place, which is meaning, which is expression, but it's also inspiration and it's sustenance. Well, thank you so much. I just want to give a chance okay, to so the audience. Uh, I'll start here. So, uh, sure, we we'll come to you, Naminata. Okay, I'm going to come. Go there, back, and then you can. Okay. Do you need a. So, Rafael. Thank you. Uh, of course, you have touched upon this idea of uh, restitution and rep uh, repatriation, uh, and the good work, Chika, you have been doing, you have been fighting theoretically in practice in many ways. I really appreciate that. But you know, yesterday, the Abati raised one question to Spivak, and she answered that she foresaw what would happen later in the very moment of articulation of the post-colonial or the post-colonial, then what would happen after restitution and repatriation if it is accumulated imperial history and global capital that drives and sustains this museum, whether it is in Johannesburg or in London, then what would happen to like African lives and African arts? Not in terms of in a unilinear kind of time, but in this moment of articulation, what would be your critic of the restitution reason? Thank you. What another brilliant panel. So my question has to do with questions of generations, but also of questions about the present. Because we, we heard that the work is also being done for the future generations. But what about the present generations? Because in order to be attentive to the future, we need to be accountable for how things fell apart in the first place. How are we thinking about how things fell, fell apart and our agentive participation in how things fell apart. Because for example, I'm from the Ivory Coast and I'm interested in recuperating uh, radio programs in my native language of Malenki. And I have to go to the archives in France to access those. So that means that we, not, we haven't been responsible toward how things fell apart. We're gonna repatriate and what is happening right now in the present is not being taken uh, into account and things will fall apart again. And two centuries from now, we'll be talking about repatriations again. So thank you. Hello. Um, I want to ask a question about who the items are being repatriated to. Um, for example, they were taken from the Kingdom of Benin. Nigeria is now a country. Are they being repatriated as a federal repatriation or back to the, the actual king? <laughs> well, um, let me take that last question or do you want to? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the, 
the the situation in Nigeria right now, or from everything that I understand, is that there's the National Commission for Museums and Monuments. Uh, Benin is part of the nation of Nigeria, right? Um, and there's a national commissions, and I believe and I understand that that's who is dealing with negotiations with you know, institutions that are intending to uh, repatriate objects. And I think that's more than sufficient for anyone who is interested in uh, returning uh, things. Uh, leave the rest to the Nigerians to sort out. Uh, but at the moment, if you're interested in repatriating, please don't use the argument, we don't know who to send them back to. <laughs> right, please, because that's another excuse that uh, institutions have given for such a long time. If you want to return the Benin uh, bronzes, so-called, I can give you the address of the National <laughs> Museums for Commissions and Monuments. That's who to uh, uh, call and tell them we want to return stuff. Um, just just so. to add to that, because I think there's a dialogue about the OBA and the state, I think there is a discussion about um, possibly a royal, bene a, a, royal um, a royal collection happening, so that th there is this discourse that's going on. But the, the formal structure is the one that, that Chica's just outlined. But there is a discussion about, specifically in Edo State and in Benin, the main museum and then that the royal household will have a sort of special collection that will be related to objects that are very specific to his household that were taken, that can be identified. Also, sort of importantly on that, you know, and my position is not really my decision. You know, I mean, it's just always used as such an excuse. Frankly, I haven't had too much difficulty talking to either NCMM, and we have been in discussion with the Royal Court as well. Um, it's not really... It's, you know, I, I, I don't want to minimize the reality of repatriation in which there's always competing stakeholders, and that's another thing, but I think it, you know, there's always competing stakeholders in everything. We can make a plan. I, I would like to int address the point, the, the second point about what are we doing now, um, and I, I think that's really important. I mean, that, that is what I consider to be my main job, actually. <laughs> Um, and we're focusing on millennial, Gen Z, global African audiences um, everywhere, and that's where we're really trying to focus our programming. And so the images that I showed you there, which I said story A or story B, for me it was story A, which is an engagement with the commission, with the Nigerian artists, uh, creating new work, um, engaging, trying to look at cross-disciplinary what what. I mean, you know, that, that is sort of what I, <laughs> repatriation's a distraction, quite frankly, <laughs> a much needed one, um, but that's not what we're here for. We shouldn't have had the stuff in the first place. That's not our job, and it's certainly not our job in like 2022, given the wholehearted assault on young people all over the world. Yeah, I, I, could, I could address you, because I think you were asking a question about um, what does this mean for Africa, essentially, or is that? Am I getting, did I get that, more or less? Um, so it, I just think that the, the discussion that's happening and what it produces for the continent is to finally be engaged in this, you know, huge problem that has been about, you know, and it, it moves across many things. I don't know if this is the right arena from the relationship to Christianity, Islam, et cetera, and cultural objects and the way in which W you know, African countries themselves have also kind of participated in the, uh, their own demonization and, and sort of, you know, um, sort of rejection of their cultures because of the indoctrination of usually religious um, structures. So what, what we're talking about is a, a situation where, you know, the continent finally starts to build institutions that allows its citizens and its future generations to actually fully understand exactly the providence of their ancestors. And in that, not just to have the cultural education, but also to participate in the economic, as well as the um, you know, nation building uh, agendas, which come from understanding who you are and being able to be proud to talk about what you stand for, where you come from, which the continent, you know, you can go to you know, any, I mean, there, there are maybe a few countries that have a very strong national identity, but you can go to a lot of countries where there is nothing. 
and, and, and the sort of trope that's left is a kind of vernacular, kind of a colonial vernacular residue which absolutely reinforces the, the stereotype, which is not true. And so this kind of shifting against this is really critical. Um, and that, for me, the idea of what this project can be in the 21st century um, is, is a way in which we start to kind of move towards a very different knowledge base, which is very powerful. Okay, maybe we should just move to uh, Gavin, and then one there, and uh, I think you've asked earlier, yeah. So we, we take these three, I come to you, Ben. Go ahead, Gavin. Uh, yeah. I want to start with the, the question about the other element in this debate, which is uh, museums are constructed for something, for a public. And I'd like to know your position on your, the relationship to the public. We talk about museums doing these things for someone. That someone is the pub publics, plural. And these publics, particularly in the form of public funded museums should become conscious of the fact that museums are funded through the monies that they take from the public. It's your money that goes into the state and is used to create these institutions. So the public has a specific role in determining how these museums behave, what these museums do, and the public are the greatest recipients of the work that museums do. So I'd like to hear what you think about the public's role. I'm thinking just of one instance, and I'm thinking here of the anti-apartheid struggle. For 12 and a half years, groups of people sat outside South Africa House in Trafalgar Square, 24 hours per day for 12 years to make that institution realize that there was something wrong. And I'm wondering if this kind of public action is not called for in this debate, whether you call for it on an African continent or an Asian continent or in the, or in the outside the doors of the museums in Europe, the great museums in London, etc. Uh, what contribution does the public make to this debate? Um, thank you, everybody. I'm a while ago, I was uh, participating in a conference at the Pitt Rivers Museum on, on restitution. And uh, to sort of, I was feeling a little bit of discomfort because I was being told very proudly by the museum how many initiatives they had about restitution, about uh, inviting uh, interested people into that. To, and then I asked the question, I said, what about your collections? And, uh, and the answer I got was that the collections were organized in a way that was interesting to the public as an arrangement. And so that made me rethink of the Pitt Rivers Museum as an object in itself. And that status as a sort of monolithic object made me think of uh, this position of relative impossibility to change things. They took away a few shrunken heads and took some nice pictures of that process. But other than that, uh, they stayed in that way. And the question I have is this, why are we so attached to this idea of aggregation of objects, immobility of objects? And I, I, I'm grateful to Chica to, in beginning to suggest this at the end of, your, um, of the conversation that maybe objects could start to move a little bit. And uh, we talk a lot about restitution, but shouldn't we return the very concept of a monolithic museum to history? Hello. Uh, I have a question, uh, a big dilemma uh, about the concept of uh, repatriation. Uh, this happened when I visited the Museum of the Baghdad, Iraq, uh, last year. And the director, uh, I was speaking with uh, her, uh, and she said that uh, in the first uh, Gulf War, uh, a lot of uh, mm, a lot of artworks and artifacts, historical artifacts, have been looted. And in the second Gulf War, uh, a lot of uh, more were uh, uh, looted and destroyed. Uh, the director, uh, when we were speaking, the director said, uh, I was uh, really more happy to see these uh, 
historical heritage in the Western museums because they are in more safer hands. Um, I just wanted to ask, what's your point of view about this statement? Thank you. You want to do that one? I'll do public. Okay. Let me respond to, to that. Well, <laughs> I think we should all be concerned about safety of works of art uh, wherever we live. Um, as you may know, there was uh, the European war, the two great European wars, right, of the 20th century. Um, who knows how many works of art the world lost as a result of those two great European wars, right? Um, so, and now there's another war going on in Europe. Uh, who knows, God forbid, uh, how many lives um, are going to be lost, and who knows how many works of architectural and uh, art cultural heritage that will be lost. So I don't think that your, or wh whoever the director is uh, knows tomorrow that they might be thumping their chest that, yeah, you have wars in your country, and so that's why you don't deserve to uh, have any of your cultural heritage with you. Well, let's pray that they don't have wars in their own. So I, I don't think that that argument uh, makes, makes sense. Uh, the histories of the world um, have been replete with, you know, devastating wars, you know, that um, millions of lives lost and countless was of cultural heritage. Um, the question about uh, the, the pit, pit rivers um, as an object, um, well, I think that's what the, the rhetoric of the global museums pretty much <laughs> was about, right? These things have been constituted to represent the whole world. And if you start asking to take out stuff from them, then they are not able to tell the story of humanity uh, that they already are structured to tell. And that's what Salah was referring to earlier as the horror vacui, right? Uh, once you give the, uh, the Greeks their stuff, then the Benin people will come, then the Ethiopians, then the, and by the time you know it, the British Museum will be empty. Well, he says something about how he got there in the first instance, right? So, so the, th that argument um, it, it has always been the primary argument for these museums. That's why they classify the stuff, you know, they have these cabinets. It's all about science and education and who is against science and education, right? Um, uh, which is the primary task of these uh, museums. It's the argument of the person who is keeping someone else's stuff, right? Uh, I've often said, uh, you know, the, in the day when the argument was, we, you know, they don't have proper institutions to keep these valuable things, so why should you give it back to them, right? Um, and it often sounded to me, uh, I, I think the first time that this came to me was in Berlin at this conference that I spoke of in 2018 uh, in Berlin, which was the capital of the BMW, right, the, the headquarters. Um, and it occurred to me in that conference, someone made similar argument, and I said to this person, well, actually, you know what this sounds like? It sounds like, uh, you know, my neighbor, um, who sees my BMW car in my one bedroom, parked in front of my one bedroom apartment and thinks that I don't deserve, you know, the BMW because, you know, hey, a one bedroom apartment, takes the BMW to his fancy garage and say, it looks good there, um, until you build a garage uh, that is deserving of this BMW, right? Okay. I don't okay. think they found it funny. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they found it funny, especially in Berlin. But but they got the point. 
I mean, to your point of the publics, I mean, we're sitting here because of the public. I, I don't think we can downplay at all the role of the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the de international decolonization movements, the activation of the young people and old people around the world in the debate and the t timing of the debate we're having now. I mean, the Benin Dialogue Group was established when? Like forever ago, um, like in the 80s. Anyway, whatever. It's been, it's been, I mean, these conversations have been happening forever. There's a reason why there's conversations happening now, and that's because the public is paying attention. And the, the thing that I find so inspiring about the public <laughs> is that the tenor of that discussion has changed a lot. It's, it's about a more institutional accountability. I think there's a lot more acknowledgement of the systemic nature of these things than perhaps in the past. Okay, so yay public. That being said, there are many different publics. And one of the arguments that I get, um, from someone I won't talk about, <laughs> um, is like, what about the public? You gotta explain stuff to them. You gotta explain, you know, what, what, what blah. Um, and I'm always like, okay, which public are you talking about? Because my goal is recognition, not explanation. I am like, there are a lot of Africans in DC who come to my museum. We don't always have to be explaining Africa to white people. Like, I think that, or, you know, we have to be very careful with this term public, because certainly in the West, the default public is like a white European public. And it erases entirely like centuries of diversity of the, you know, of the body politic or whatever. And I'm always so, you know, yes, I am talking to people, but my role as a museum is not to educate or it's not to explain. It's to create a space of belonging, of recognition, of inspiration, and of sustainability. And, and I think that's really important. But, you know, public activism is also super important. I have, I have, I have the mic. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I wasn't going to say anything, but uh, I just, I just had to say something. But, uh, Are you did you give me the? You gave me the floor. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. About museums. I mean, this concept of the public and the, what does the public mean in situations in, in countries like. And, and I don't want to say global south, maybe I can just talk about my specific experience. What does the public mean in a country like Ethiopia? Uh, I was a director of a museum for six years. And uh, what does a public mean in, in, in that museum? People are not familiar in museum culture. I have, in the six years that I was the director of a museum, uh, very handful of Ethiopians came to that museum because they did not understand uh, what, you know, what was represented. So we have to understand what museums mean in these societies. You know, so what do museums, I mean, uh, but I want to, um, museums have to be interactive with the community. Museums have to talk to the community. We cannot really uh, mime a Western, museum, a Western museum in this context. So we really have to understand what the public means when we talk about museums in this country, in these countries. Uh, so, I mean, um, David Ajay's work, I'm a very great admirer of your work, uh, uh, Sir David Ajay, but the, your museum, at the, the Museum of African American Art in Washington, D.C., is one of the most interactive museums that I've ever seen. You know, I, I've seen African American people come in there and just talk to whatever was being represented in there. So, you know, we have to talk about museums in these countries from a different context. So the public does, it's, it, 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 uh, it, anyway, he's looking at his watch, okay. <laughs> I, I'd, so like, I'd love to quickly. Sorry. One is that. The second point is we have to understand that museums are, museums are political projects. So let's not forget their political projects. We're talking about it like it's, uh, you know, excluded from the project of politics. So representing a, a, a few, including a few, and excluding a great majority of us. So we have to talk about museums from that context as well. I just wanted to say that, thank you.
Hi. I'm so sorry. I think I have the mic, but I can pass it to you next if, if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, first of all, I really want to thank you for this conversation. I think I want to acknowledge actually something that's very unique about this situation, which is that we have a scholar, a museum director, and an architect at, on the same stage, and you guys are talking in unison about kind of progress that needs to make, be made in your individual's fields, but that can only be successful if you work together. So for example, um, David, your new museum will only be successful with hopefully a visionary director and a curatorial team that comes on board to steward the sort of vision that you have started. Likewise, Neri, I'm sure you're thinking about the architecture of the institution and how to reframe that. And Chica, the scholarship and how it connects to kind of museums moving forward. Um, I think this is all really great, but I think we're in this moment where there is this confluence of thinking happening across these disciplines but we need to kind of accelerate the curatorial knowledge and the kind of protagonists who can kind of reflect this new direction. And I'm, I guess that I see a pressure point, not only on you guys as individuals to kind of get us to that place that we need to be very quickly, but then how do we make sure that you know, the years and years and years and years of training that's needed for people to come and take the baton it happens in the space of time that David opens his museum. And I just wanted to reflect on that sort of like pressure point and how hopefully these different disciplines can work together to arrive at that point. Um, I have the mic as well after. Um, I was past the mic um, after. So may I, or shall I just? So please go ahead, and then there will be two, uh, Francois and then Vivian. It's okay. I mean, I, it's Francois and Vivian. I don't know who else. Go ahead and be very brief. Very quickly. Okay. Um, uh, the first question is for Nier. Um, sorry, it's going to be a bit of a rhetorical question, but it's also genuine. Um, you know, to have a new vision for the museum and Smithsonian to be the custodian of that new vision is something I've been thinking about since your presentation. Like, why should we give it to Smithsonian? Um, and especially, I like the idea that both David and uh, Chica outlined about conjoining networks of museums. So, I mean, the reason I ask this is because I mean, at the end of the day, it's not just a, an accumulation of capital, but also an accumulation of symbolic capital. And so for the new vision of the museum to be embodied in the Smithsonian just feels like a reproduction of the same model, sure, with, with some redistribution of capital uh, to some extent. And to uh, David and Chica, I was just thinking that in this vision of conjoined networks and circulation of museums, um, like one of the things is that it, it, it has to, it, it reminds me of, say, um, what uh, the Poetics of Relation, who's the author? Um, Glissant, yeah, sorry. Uh, Glissant, in, 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 in his book, writes about the abyss as integral to this history, the abyss of the ship, the abyss of drowning in the oceans, and the abyss that, that is unfathomable in history. And so how do museums then capture this? Because if it's going to be an excavation of artifacts and an accumulation of artifacts, where does the abyss go? Because the museum has to narrate that rupture and that abyss. And these are the two questions, yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna give the last two and then I'll give you uh, maybe two minutes each to take any question and so forth. So Francoise and then Binyam, and then Rashid, it's okay. Okay, Rashid, go ahead. <laughs> no, moi, moi c'est génial. Tout ce que vous dites, bon, je connais le musée de Washington, je connais tout le travail de nos amis qui est formidable. Il y a une traduction d'abord ou pas Fait tarjama, amela. Goula bel arabe, yana terjim lek. La khlini, bel farans, yana mustamar, mustamar, mouch mouch. He said he's colonized. Chauf salah. عرفنا وزير ثقافة في بلاد عربية ما نسميها 
وطقعت عن القلابات والثورات بعث ناس للمتحف مش يسترقون اشياء مش ما عاد يبيعوها هو على الخير الوقت الحالي عارفين انه صاير في في صنعاء كمان تخريب كله العمل اللي تعمل اليونسكو تخل تخرب صديقتنا كانت تقول لك في المتحف نتاعها ما كانش ناس من الشعب اللي يدخلون انا في اليمن شفت عروش نسوان حافيين داخلين المتحف سمعت هذا كل يعني شيء كل منطقه فيها شيء جديد حاجه مهمه كثير لنا انا من العصر نتاعي كثير اصدقاء توفوا حتى حدا ما تولى الارشيف نتاعهم او سيره حياتهم اوكي الشغل اللي نتكلموا عليه في المتاحف الاوروبيين والامريكي وكل شيء ماشي الحال ولكن الحضاره تاع الوقت الحالي هذه للمستقبل تاع القطر كله سمعت حتى حدا ما يتلف لها الورثه يلوحوا في الزبل عن الوثائق كلها والصور ولا الشيء اللي كان لازم نفكر كمان في هذا هذا راهو ثمن كبير اسمه كنز كبير سمعت لا هذا لازم ندوروا ليه نتفرجوا فيه الباقي انا اقول لك السؤال اللي عندي نقول ساعات الاشياء اللي في المتاحف الاوروبيه والامريكيه محافظه اكثر من تدخل بلدنا انا شايف في بلادي في الجزائر الحاله اللي فيها المتحف الوطني كمان راي مصيبه لان الاشياء يعني مش سهله مش نلم في بلادي ومن بعد نشوف واش نعمل اسمح لي I think if I, if I just may summarize uh, uh, Rashid argument is that he was really uh, uh, regarding the, the dismal situation in countries uh, in the Arab world and in Africa of how ministers actually participate in the looting of their own national museum and that the situation in terms of security or conservation or preservation is so terrible and that sometimes he almost fall into this argument about how maybe those objects are well preserved in the West, which is an argument that to some degree, although it falls within the colonial trap, but, it's, but it is uh, uh, sometime when people look at the dismal situation uh, uh, they would say, well, they better stay there. So I hope I did justice yeah, uh, to his, there are other um, uh, Arab speakers here who could, who could uh, raise that, uh, maybe my translation is not that great, but I think, I, I, I hope I grasp the, the argument itself. So please, uh, Francoise or, or, or Biniam, either of you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Salah, and uh, thank you for a very informative session. My question is to Chika. Uh, earlier he talked about the retain and explain sort of description. And I was thinking as a space for scholarly engagement and for activism. Now that explain is in that picture, what are the, the potentials of expanding the frontiers of the explanation so that it includes you know all the whole story not that it's explained selectively including the violence that you have mentioned and probably also reversing the order explain and what my hope is that if it is explained wholly with all the violence, then it may lead to a different result. Maybe return. While that is returned, part of it can be kept because I see that these museums are now part of that story as well. And there could be some creative ways of doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's just uh, perhaps more a remark and a question. Because uh, a report last year showed that we have more than 100,000 museums in the world. Most of them are in Western Europe. And a lot of them will not you know, go, uh, be able to reopen after COVID. So that's also the situation in incredible inequalities. The last museum are in the Middle East, I mean Africa, Middle East and a little, you know, South Africa, so they were, uh, South America, sorry, and of course Africa very less. So what also this idea, so this museum in Benin, fantastic, but also this raised the question of inventing different museums that perhaps doing big global museums around the world, and I agree also, is it, you know, returning object or Im imagining also how we're gonna tell story, perhaps not through the object 
that has been the way the West has told the story. You have an object, there is a story. And a lot of, uh, you know, in what we call the global source, they would do not have the object is not necessarily from what you tell the story. You know, memories, all the things. So also it's perhaps the possibility of inventing uh, also things rather than because we are in this situation in a lot of museums will not reopen, are not reopening. They lost a lot. I can take some of them. I can't yeah, remember yeah. everything, but I'll take some Each of the ones. Each of you could take any okay. number of questions and answer them in about, maybe we, we can extend it up to eight minutes. Okay. So, go ahead. So, a couple of the points that I'm getting about this idea of the public and also what, you know, I sense this idea that, that maybe there's a thought that we're just replicating or the, re the building of museums in Africa is just replicating what's in the West. I think that you're, you're misreading it if you see it that way. The construction of museums was about creating a globally superior group of people who looked at the world in a new way, and it worked. You know, it, it actually worked. It's created this sense that we have this, you know, overview in the world. The construction of the museum, and, and they were palaces to kind of edify people through that system. The construction, the project of the construction of museums on the continent is also profoundly um, important in that way of constructing the citizen anew. And when we talk about, you know, um, when, when I hear, I've heard this frustration from uh, cura you know, directors who say, but in Africa or somewhere, that, you know, the, the local people don't come. Well, because the museums are constructed in the same narrative as the global museum and that, that, that does not, con you know, connect through. What, what is being attempted now is to construct the museum with its empowering code being about the place. So for instance, the Benin Museum really is about placing in the heart of Benin a massive you know, 10 acre landscape that is going to be used by the public. It's more or less being designed as the first social center of the community because there is none. And that is the kind of driver, and it has within it a contemporary art museum, it has within it all these um, social and teaching spaces, uh, 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 you know, uh, an arena for uh, an auditorium for lectures, et cetera. It's really a kind of creating first a social and community center, which empowers, and then a place which then kind of then disseminates the information. So I think that the project of the museum in the global south is not necessarily to say, okay, we're going to reject the idea of the museum and go back to some kind of providence of the object and its relationship to our culture, because that's gone but to kind of find a way in which the notion of the museum and to, see, to understand the power of the museum as an object which can edify and lift us, um, citizens as a device to find a way in which they can become empowering agents within the development of African cities and communities as, we are, as, 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 as they're evolving and developing. And I think that's the challenge and that's the excitement of it because it is clearly a device that can empower um, and edify. Um, so I think that that has to be really clear um, in understanding what we're doing. There was a lot of stakeholder discussion, and really this is what the community wanted, a place that they could have that was their own. So that, that's to answer that. With um, Yasmi's um, uh, uh, question, I think that this, the, the urgency of the pipeline could not be you know, more important. Um, but the, the making visible of the form and, and then the sense of urgency is exactly what this is about, you know, because until the image of it appeared, this idea that a curator was necessary wasn't even being discussed. And that is part of the whole building up. When, this, when Lonnie was building the Smithsonian, he had a handful of curators. And now it is like there are scholars coming out of the woodwork, <laughs> you know, and that's in nine years. You know, when we started that museum, there wasn't even a collection. There was, there were, there are 2,000 objects in the original Smithsonian, and everybody said you didn't need anything about African Americans because it was already there. So you can't actually underestimate what happens when you make visible and you produce the forms and how it impacts the societies in which it, it, it affects and how they're edified. And when it's brought from that position of not being a colonial project that's brought in, but as a project that comes from the inside out, I really think, uh, you know, I think the museums that we are talking about are about the cultures yearning and screaming for their own institutions. That is a big difference to a federal museum or, or something else. And I think that, that agency, I think, is very exciting and has the potential to be a very powerful tool for development. 
I think also it's important for us to be museum literate in a way is to understand what is a museum because museums are not only its collections and it's also not only its building. It's a whole combination of different things and the different skills that are required to work in a museum and how a museum engages with its public can be completely parsed. I think that all cultures have modes of education or engagement. All cultures have modes of belonging, creating connection, have civic spaces, have places that value treasures. I think there's all those different things, those activities of a museum. And I, and I must say, you know, sort of to your point about why at the Smithsonian hoarding, I mean, you know, my previous job was as a museum consultant and I consulted with over 55 different museums. I've always been more or less the same person um, and saying the same thing. And when I talk to many of my clients in the Global South, I always get that. Well, ours is not a museum going culture. And I'm like, well, yours is probably not a Western museum going culture, <laughs> but certainly like all these other functions are, are there. But, but also on that point, I think it's really important that we develop collaboration opportunities. As I said at the end of my talk, I have I am in no need to keep anything um, for us. I'm very much, I think we need to build networks and collaborate more. And, and also to Francoise's point, I think it's extremely important that we acknowledge what we have lost through COVID. And, you know, as institutions that have a certain amount of funding, it is absolutely our responsibility to reach out, create space, create resources for those who have lost it. And, and I think that also goes for different hiring models, and my, my final point, I guess, to SOMI in terms of the pipelines, I think it's about making sure we have those pipelines, but also assessing what are the skills we really need. You know, does everybody really need to have like three PhDs um, in order to be a curator? No offense, PhD people, but like, you know, it, 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 museums are a terrible like career in most countries, right? And I mean, the barriers to entry are ridiculous. You need to, you know, sink yourself into post-secondary debt, like out of your, you know, whatever, just to even get a like twenty-five thousand dollar a year job. Um, it's insane. And I think we need to also like look at the kind of institutional mechanics behind that and look at different forms of like what are those pipelines and maybe broaden those a little bit as much as we try and like build skills. Um, in different places. So two things. One of the arguments that I've made about this thing that I'm uh, you know, calling a post-colonial museum is that when you look at the, this argument, they don't have museum cultures or museum traditions in, you know, in Africa and elsewhere. Uh, it just strikes me this is born out of ignorance, born out of the erasure, right, of the colonial violence. Um, because actually, when you think about the Yoruba, when they fight wars in the day, right, inter-regional, uh, inter-imperial wars, you know where they, they go for first? The palace, right? Burn down the palace. That's the biggest prize. Right, and why is that? It's not because palaces were like the ones you have in Europe that are owned by the wealthy families and, and you know the family. It's that the palaces were owned by the communities, and therefore getting at the palace is striking at the heart of the community. That's why also the palaces were they are museums. That's where the lives of the communities. That's why they are the center of the cities or the towns. That's where the lives of the communities, ritual, social, political, aesthetic lives play out. So if we are thinking about reimagining the museum, it will be based in these communities or in these societies that think about the commonwealth, right? That's why they don't go to the National Museum in Lagos, because that's something someone built, some government people built and expect us to go. So it's children that go there. But they still go to their hometowns. In my hometown, I'll travel from Princeton whenever it's an uh, annual festival to go attend the masquerade. And so if we're thinking about the new museum of the futures, is to, is to reimagine this, these publics. Because they are still yearning. In Lagos, there are hardly any of these Western-type museums, right? The ones that are there, nobody goes to. But they are still looking for spectacle. If museums are places of spectacle, they are still looking for them in the village squares, in the town squares, and, and so forth. So there are ways of thinking about the museum, reimagining the public, not the 
you know, Habermasian, you know, pu publics and, and stuff. It's like the publics that are constituted from, from below because that's where the museums were established, the, the, the communal houses, the palaces, and so forth. So that's how to think about the, the museum that will be patronized, used, so much so than what you have as your Western style museum. Now to your question about the narratives, the stories, the explain and so forth, where to begin is with restitution. I do not and will not trust any museum trying to explain Benin bronzes um, on the basis of they own these objects and therefore own the story that they want to tell. If these objects, if these artifacts are restituted, that means you don't get to tell the story the way you want to tell it. You will have to consult with the owners of the objects. And that goes to all the, from the, yesterday's panel, the, the communities of people who actually own these objects have got to have a voice in how their stories are told. And so whether or not uh, the, let's say the Obas Palace decides if the Smithsonian restituted all the, the bronzes that they have and the Obas says, well, you can keep five or keep one to be cultural ambassadors, which is what he said in the past um, and still, then they will have a voice in the stories that are told in that museum because they are now active stakeholders to those artifacts and the stories that are told about them. So it, it, they don't get to decide what to say or not to say. It will have to depend on a, an active negotiation and discussion with the stakeholders of these cultural heritages because it is also, in fact, primarily their stories. And you don't get to museum explain it, not just mansplaining. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That Well, you've seen the reaction, and I would just say I want to thank you all, David, Nieri, Chica, and the audience for, for their engagement enthusiastically. One more day that has been more successful, add to the success of yesterday. So thank you. Thanks to the staff of the uh, Art Foundation for their full dedication. Thank you so much.